Welcome to Micro College. Um, we're recording today on the 12th of July, 2022. Um, the 12th of July is, is an important day for us. This is the birthday of Henry David Thoreau. Happy birthday, Henry David. <laughs> 205 Happy years birthday. old. <laughs> Um, and it's a, also a very special day for us because we have a, have a really special guest. Um, today we're speaking with uh, Sue Darlington, who is the president of Deep Springs College. Um, Deep Springs, as, as listeners to the podcast will know, is, is a really important part of the, the background and history of, of Thoreau College um, and also of, of myself. Um, I'm an alum, um, class of 1998, Deep Springs College. Um, Deep Springs is is a one of a kind, a real um, one of, one of the the real shiny examples of uh, of experimentation and of innovation uh, in higher education, and we consider it to be really the 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 prototype of the micro college. Um, Deep Springs was started in 1917 um, by L. L. Nunn. Um, it is a two year accredited liberal arts college. Uh, with between 25 to 30 students. It's located on a, a working cattle ranch um, in the high desert of Eastern California, just north of Death Valley, and about 45 minutes from the nearest town. Um, so it's very isolated out in the high desert. Um, all the students who attend are, are there in full scholarship. Um, they engage in a, in, a, in a really holistic curriculum um, based around three pillars, academics, labor, and self-governance. Um, and the goal of Deep Springs, uh, very clearly stated from the founder down to the present day, is to prepare people for lives of service um, to humanity and to the, what the founder called the moral order of the universe. Um, Sue Darlington has been the president of Deep Springs College for two years now, since 2020. Um, and before that, she was a professor of anthropology at Asian, and, and Asian studies at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, another really noteworthy example of, uh, of innovation and experimentation in higher education. Um, she was a, pres a professor there for 30 years. Her research focuses on socially engaged Buddhism and particularly on the interactions between environmentalism and Buddhism in Thailand. Welcome, Sue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a real honor to have you on. Um, so we like to start here on the podcast with a biographical question, um, and I'd just like to, to ask you to reflect back on um, your own education and uh, specifically you know, what, what you were doing in the years right after high school, you know, uh, 18 to 21, when people are typically in college. Uh, I was pretty typical. I was in college. <laughs> I... <laughs> followed coming coming out of a family that is heavily focused on education i think all of my grandparents some of my great grandparents and all my aunts and uncles and many of my cousins were all educators of some kind or another you know my my great grandmother attended the university of michigan in the 1890s oh, wow. so um it was kind of expected you go straight on to college <laughs> and uh, I went to I went to Wellesley uh, it was where my mother was teaching chemistry labs and I got a free education as a result Fantastic. and kind of made it a no-brainer choice to go there and uh, lived on campus and immersed myself in both academics and and just the life of, of being in college mm -hmm. uh, so when you I, when you think back to that era what were what were the the things you you remember valuing the most what were the richest parts of of, of that 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 college experience probably two stand out for me one is i had an absolutely amazing advisor i took a class with her my first semester and she, I, I hadn't decided what i was going to major in but i took her intro to anthropology and declared my anthropology major before the end of that semester and she just really encouraged me, motivated me, was an incredible example. Um, the, other, the other real memory I have is less directly academic, which is I ended up joining the Shakespeare Ensemble of MIT, where uh -huh. we had wealthy well, cross-registration. And not being a Shakespeare scholar in any way, not being a literature major or an English <laughs> major, I was fascinated by theater and became fascinated by Shakespeare in particular by working with this group of students and a really strong director. Um, so this and is a performance-based performance program. Yeah. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I worked on the, on the crew, and occasionally I performed, and we, we travel in addition to putting on shows at MIT, we traveled up and down the East Coast, uh, performing at, mostly at other colleges. And I guess, again, similar to my academic experience of having a really strong mentor, was having a strong mentor in our director, mm-hmm. and being challenged to do things that I didn't necessarily know I could do and being challenged to to do things that maybe I wasn't the best at but I could definitely improve it mm-hmm. and that that influenced a lot of my approach to teaching from from that point on yeah you know, that, I, when I reflect on my own career as a teacher I, I think about theater experiences as being really important and formative in that and can you can you draw the lines there between your, your performance experience in college and and your and your teaching career Absolutely. I I have a pretty good story about that. Right after I graduated from college, I worked for two years as an editorial assistant for a classical archaeologist at Harvard. And when I decided to go to grad school, I asked him for a lot of recommendation. And he Mm -hmm. gladly wrote it. I didn't see it for several years when I was already at the University of Michigan in grad school, and for some reason I was able to see my my file that they had. And I came across this letter from Professor Hoffman, and it, it didn't say anything about how I was as an editorial assistant, uh, anything about my writing, or the things that I had expected that he would be emphasizing because I worked for him. What he wrote about was the fact that I was doing Shakespeare, Shakespeare performances, and that therefore he expected I would become a really strong teacher. Uh-huh. And that's all he said in the letter. And <laughs> I got into that program. And it, it, it was a recommendation it, based it, on future development. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But coming out of the Shakespeare, he said, anyone that can perform Shakespeare and do it so consistently, because I'd been doing it at that point for five years, he he argued that, that if you can stand up in front of people and perform Shakespeare, you can stand up in front of people and teach. <laughs> um, but I think it more, rather than being able to stand up in front which is a particular approach to mm-hmm. teaching that I tend not to use. Mm-hmm. I I think of the theater preparation as being able to think on your feet, being able to roll when things don't go well, having the confidence to be in front of people, to, to listen and respond to everybody around you. Um, that's what the theater can help you with, with your teaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that that really resonates with my own experience. I think um, as as a teacher, I've taught for for sixteen years at the high school level, as well as the teaching I've done here in the last couple of years with the college. Um, you know, I think about my theater experiences, and the other set of experiences were there at Deep Springs, working with working with horses and cattle. I was the cowboy there for for three summers, oh. and uh, that similar kind of things that you're mentioning. Get back on the horse when you're bucked off. <laughs> You know, thinking about you know yeah. complexity and uncertainty and the weather and uh, and I find that that really a lot of that comes back to teaching experience. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. It's I think teaching is only only a fraction of it is about the actual content of what the subject matter is. Mm-hmm. So much more is about being flexible, uh, listening to and responding to the students and. Uh, encouraging them and that's where these kinds of lived experiences can make a difference yeah so your your teaching experience you know for for the bulk of the time has been at at a very unique institution um hampshire college um as i mentioned you know really shows up on 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 lists of of distinctive and innovative campuses um, and programs i wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and and what was it like specifically to be a to be a a professor to be an instructor at a place like that hampshire was my ideal when I was finishing grad school and getting on the job market, uh, my friends started calling me up saying, hey, Sue, your job was just advertised in the Chronicle of Higher Education. And it was a position at Hampshire for a professor of anthropology of religion focused in South or Southeast Asia. And it to me, it was 
it was the ideal. It was, I had already realized I did not want to teach at a big research institution where the focus was on research and the undergraduate students hardly ever met the professors and were taught primarily by TAs in large, often very large classes. I mean, I was a TA for a class that had almost 600 people in it, for mm -hmm. example. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be at a small school that really emphasized undergraduate experience. I wanted to be at one that really emphasized teaching. And I, a perk was it put me back in Massachusetts, which is where I, where I grew up. Mm -hmm. so I really was excited to be at Hampshire because of the amount of choice that it gives the students, the amount of control it gives them over their own education. They design their own concentration. It's usually interdisciplinary and surrounding a question that they then explore. And every student does a project at the end, their final year. They do a year-long project guided by two faculty advisors. And what I appreciated was that the, the students at Hampshire were risk takers. They were mm -hmm. asking really challenging questions. They were willing to take the chances that they couldn't find the answer or they'd find answers they weren't expecting and they were willing to problem solve and start over if they or go in a new direction if something wasn't proving fruitful they were really partners in their education rather than consumers of their education and that that's what i really loved about the place i i was constantly learning from the students because yeah. they put me together with a biology professor or a photographer or a literature professor or a film professor, you know, name the other field. I worked with so many other people in other fields and disciplines where the students' questions were what bringing us together and exploring the ways our fields connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's something that, that I hear more and more from talking to people who are working in more conventional institutions in higher education that that they're they're seeing more risk aversion right people people are, you know, the students are less willing to, to take those risks so what do you think about what is about Hampshire that that encourages that or opens up the space for for that type of risk taking you're talking about I think a lot of it is because there's a real a genuine belief that the students can do it that the students should be the ones driving their learning and that you learn most by taking risks you you if you take the comfortable route the obvious route and say well i just want to learn this body of knowledge and you don't go anywhere new you just you learn what other people have already figured out and hampshire puts the students in a situation where from the very beginning they had to ask questions and you know, the, the basic knowledge that it's growing from is important, mm -hmm. no doubt about it. But um, but it's by asking the students questions and putting them in charge of figuring it out. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like, what are you going to study? We're not going to hand you a list of majors to choose from. Mm -hmm. So already they have to think, well, wait a minute, what is it I really want to learn? And that's hard for a lot of students. Mm -hmm. That's very hard. And it gives them a whole new way of thinking about their education and enables them to go in those new directions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems to be um, also, my sense is that it, it really demands of the the instructor, the, the professors, the kind of willingness to really mentor on an individual level that you were talking about really benefiting from in your own college experience. Um, Absolutely. Is there? I, I'm, Absolutely. I'm curious at a place like Hampshire. Uh, what is the the you know, the collaboration or colleagueship among the the faculty? Are they are they talking about how to do that? Is there a craft of of teaching that's being cultivated at an institution like that? Yes, yes. They they have a center of I think it's called a center of teaching and learning. And what it in some some institutions they go in and they film people and they tell them how they could be better teachers. At Hampshire, they ran workshops. They would bring us together in small groups and and do different kinds of exercises to brainstorm, to talk about and share what works, what are the challenges we were having in our classes or in our advising or our work with with the the students in their final year. And what are some of the techniques 
for teaching that are being done elsewhere. We spent a lot of time talking about things like uh, learning differences and recognizing that there isn't there isn't a hierarchy in ways people learn, but there are a lot of differences and how do you how do you think about teaching students who you have a diverse group of students in your classroom who have different experiences and different learning styles and how do you make sure you're including all of them and it really helped to be able to talk with other faculty and hear their experiences and read things about the theory of learning the theory of teaching and then turn around and try to put that into practice in in my own teaching and my own advising and I think that helped combined with the responses I would get from the students because the, I would mm -hmm. I would ask for a lot of feedback from students in my teaching and the they you could tell whether what you were trying out is something new mm -hmm. is it is it working or is this just <laughs> going way off the track right and mm -hmm. and modeling for them that uh, oh it, maybe that wasn't a great approach let's try something new I, you know I'm not I'm I can make mistakes. I'm still learning, and we can learn together. And I think that's another way that the students would get more able to take those risks. They'd see mm -hmm. us taking risks. Micro College is recorded in the broadcast studios of WDRT Viroqua, 91.9 FM, Driftless Community Radio, on Main Street in Viroqua, Wisconsin. Thanks to Jim and all the folks at WDRT for the support of Thoreau College and the Micro College podcast. Yeah, that, that quality of vulnerability and transparency in, in trying things on is something that, that is really important in, to me as a, and of the concept of a micro college um, of Deep Springs or Thoreau College scale. Um, so, so now you're, you've taken on this, this role of leadership role at, at Deep Springs. Um, and, uh, you know, this has been a momentous and, and complex time to do it. Obviously, the, the COVID epidemic that the whole world has been living through. Um, but also at Deep Springs, people will have heard about Deep Springs will know that um, it has gone through a transition in its student body um, up until 2018. It was an all-male institution. Um, and since, since 2018, has admitted women as well. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you were the first woman to be the leader of Deep Springs. Um, so lots of, lots of um, like big things to tackle and, uh, and uh, yeah, and just Deep Springs itself. So I wonder if you could tell the story of how you, how you got interested in Deep Springs and, and, how, and, uh, and how it has been to, to step into this leadership role at this complex time. Well, that's a that's a huge question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two or three in rolled in together. Um, yeah, I I had only heard peripherally about Deep Springs. I, I I knew the name when the search firm that was looking for the president for Deep Springs called and asked if they could speak with me. And apparently, they reached out to some other people at Hampshire as well. I think they saw Hampshire as a place that because it has this different approach to education and more focused on risk-taking and giving students a lot of control over their own education, they, they, I think they were thinking, okay, somebody that's connected to Hampshire will have a, an understanding of, at least partial understanding of what Deep Springs is doing. Mm -hmm. And the more I started researching into Deep Springs, the more excited I got about this place. I mean, I loved Hampshire. I, I started there right out of grad school. I figured I would retire from there. Um, at that moment in time, Hampshire was was struggling over enrollment, over some, some bad choices by, by the administration, and was trying to figure out how to shrink the faculty without laying people off. And I, so I had a twofold motive for applying to Deep Springs. One was I could help Hampshire, because I'd been there so long that if I left, my salary could help more than one faculty <laughs> member stay. Um, but it wasn't just leaving Hampshire, it was, I wouldn't just go anywhere. I, I looked at Deep Springs and thought, oh my gosh, what what a concept, <laughs> what a place that, and I visited here early on in the process. They brought, they brought some of the candidates, not simultaneously, but they brought candidates out to the college so that you, we would have an idea of what we might be getting into. And it, it's almost impossible to describe Deep Springs mm -hmm. without experiencing it. 
and the location, how isolated it is, and also the intensity and the intensity of the of of the living experience. It's a very small community. You're living on top of each other. It's hard to get away from each other. And that for the students, the intensity of the educational program, of really rigorous academics, the labor program, and especially the self-governance, where they have to take so much responsibility for for the whole student body and also contribute significantly to major things at the college, like hiring faculty and selecting the new students. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can hear that intellectually and say, wow, that's kind of cool. But until you come out here and talk with the students, it's really hard to grasp what that entails. And that trip coming out here and talking especially with the the rising second year students, it was at July, so they had just started their second year, and were the student leaders and talking with them about what self-governance is and how it works and watching them work wrestle through an argument in the student body was so exciting in terms of the maturity level, the the different angles they brought to the argument, um, just different ways of approaching it, and I I was really incredibly impressed and said, yeah, I, w- I really would love to be part of this. Um, it's it, it's a lot harder than I expected getting here. Um, like you said, I arrived in the midst of COVID and some really difficult decisions, and the students were convinced because we're so isolated that they were invulnerable to COVID, but um, they're not, and we're not as isolated as they think in, in many ways. I mean, staff and faculty are going in and out of town on a mm-hmm. fairly regular basis on college business and personal business and the students were were traveling over breaks and I learned fairly shortly after getting here that the heating system in the dorm was not functioning properly and was circulating recirculating inside air around the whole dorm mm-hmm. and I was really worried that once they traveled over winter break that if one student came back with COVID this is before we had vaccines, right? right. Those are students One from student. uh, traveling all over the world, right? These are, this is really a global traveling people come to a small, isolated yeah. place. Yeah, and then coming back. And we actually saw that this January where they did travel and they came back. Mm-hmm. And, and the, uh, I'd say over about a three-week period, 17 people got sick. And we had to isolate people and then cover. They they were amazing because they, they just leapt in and covered each other's labor and re, you know kept make sure that people who are isolated and sick were getting fed and taken care of and just jumping the fence team came in to cook because the the <laughs> team helping in the kitchen all went down because they <laughs> they were all living together and working together and so one got sick they all got sick and in um, some ways a crisis is is especially a good educational opportunity or as long as anyone, everyone makes it through i mean that's a exactly yeah exactly yeah so it, it's been a challenge. I mean, I, I sent the students all away for the, the winter of 21, so January, yeah. February. and they Some of them came here that. to Viroqua. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And, and they really, the alums stepped up and, and provided, provided internships and independent studies. And some of them, some of the students did uh, remote classes at other institutions. Mm-hmm. We actually had one fa- visiting faculty member she was she was coming here for the that spring for january through april and she had sublet her apartment so she had to come out here even though none of our students were here anymore and she ended up teaching her class remotely to our students who are elsewhere yeah. she's on the deep <laughs> springs campus the students are elsewhere it was it was and actually what just yesterday one of those students was telling me what an excellent class that was <laughs> Um, but yeah. it was not, it was not the <laughs> typical deep spring situation, and fortunately, it was only for one term. And uh, when they came back, they were more determined than ever to not repeat that, and mm-hmm. just jumped in to really figure out how do we how do we plan for COVID. And and then when it hit in this past January in twenty two. Their plans worked, and even though people got sick, they 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 did. I think they controlled it. I think if they hadn't had the plans they had set up, it, even more people would have gotten sick. So, mm-hmm. 
I was really impressed with how they how they pulled together and made that happen. And a lot of that was motivation to make sure that I wouldn't send them away again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they were not happy with me for that, and, and that lingered for quite a while. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, be, being the president of Deep Springs, I mean, uh, is a unique position because of self-governance and the size and intimacy of that community. And I think oh. I, I'm wondering if you can. Re- I mean, how how did your how did it compare to being a professor at Hampshire? Was that you know, were you, what would prepare for a person for that role? <laughs> Not much prepares you for this role. Um, <laughs> it is you have to have a thick skin here. Believe me, um, I was dean of advising. Uh, at Hampshire for a couple of stints. And I think that prepared me more than than just teaching. I think the teaching helped because I had a good good working relationships with my students and a lot of collaborative relationships with my students at Hampshire. And that's, that kind of working relationship is important here. Mm-hmm. But being the dean of advising meant that I was in a position at Hampshire where I I saw the struggles that students could have mm-hmm. and and had to make some really difficult and sometimes unpopular decisions mm-hmm. and I was a, I was a, a dean of the School of Critical Social Inquiry as well uh, leading into this during this time when Hampshire was struggling in in 2019 2020 and that also helped me think about being here and the and how you make decisions and how you have to respond and weigh all these different perspectives and sometimes make unpopular decisions mm-hmm. but you have to really think both how something impacts the individual the ind- specific individuals involved and how does it impact the larger campus mm-hmm. um, the larger community and often the rest of the community doesn't see everything that goes into those decisions because sometimes it has to do with confidential information Mm -hmm. or or just things that are going on behind the scenes that the students in particular might not see. I mean, even Mm -hmm. at at Deep Springs, where they're very involved in so many aspects of running the college, they don't always see all the everything that goes on behind the scenes Mm -hmm. and they're not party to all the conversations that have to happen when you're making a tough decision Mm -hmm. and they that gets frustrating for them and then they turn back around and and can be quite critical in the process Mm -hmm. and it's a it's a learning experience and it it can take a lot of time to play out because it has to be done very carefully and that many decisions have to happen slowly because everybody has to be consulted Mm -hmm. and everybody needs to be heard and you can't it's very hard here to just say this is what's happening yeah it it has to be done where these are the are the issues that are pushing a decision that that mean a decision needs to be made and then everybody gets a chance to chime in and think about it and you got to push them to try to think about different perspectives and yeah, I would say another a part of Deep Springs culture that that I really have appreciated, but also slows down a process is is really a habit of looking at at first principles of you know basic kind of metaphysical and, and ethical kind of assumptions behind any decision, including the most mundane. Um, and if you're gonna you're really gonna consider things in that way, um, it's uh, yeah you need to slow down the process and uh, and yeah. and have a lot of conversations. But, um, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So we've done, jumped into some of the nuts and bolts of Deep Springs here, and I guess I'd like to to pull it back a little bit and and kind of lay those out again and and see you know um, your response, you know why these are important, why they they fit in. Um, so with Micro College, the podcast here, Thoreau College, we've identified um, a few characteristics of of what we see as peer institutions or, or defining Micro College. One of those, obviously, is size. Um, I'm wondering if you can you know, talk about Deep Springs, which has an explicit uh, mission of developing leaders, uh, people who will be of service, uh, lives of service. Um, how does a, a very small institution, again, Deep Springs, when I was there, I had about 25, 26 students. It's been, in the last few years, maybe up to as many as 30, but you know, very small group of students. How does that um, support that mission, that small size? 
and it's 26 students right now, too. Um, uh-huh. So it, it, it doesn't fluctuate very far. Right. <laughs> I, I think because it means that students can't hide. It's, it's small. It means every student has a role in the college, has some kind of a role, and what, what they do has effects across the rest of the community. At a larger institution, I think students can easily hide. They can, they can either get lost or they can deliberately hide um, and avoid taking on responsibility. And at a school, especially a school like Deep Springs, where it's, it's responsibility for your learning in the classroom and outside the classroom. And the labor, for example, if you don't do the feed run and collect the eggs and feed the animals, there are consequences. Mm-hmm. And if you if you don't get the eggs back to, to the boarding house, to the kitchen, there may not be breakfast. And other people are going to feel it, and they're going to know that you are responsible for that. There is a built-in, there's several built-in tensions in Deep Springs that can be really hard to to navigate, but are part of developing that sense of service and and leadership. And one is actually the principle of isolation. It's one of the ground rules Mm -hmm. that the students cannot leave the campus during term unless the whole student body agrees, unless it's a, a medical issue or something unavoidable like that. And a lot of people say, well, how can we learn to be service when we don't even know the outside world? We don't know mm-hmm. any other community. We can't go and volunteer somewhere. Um, how, how are we learning service? And my, my, what I've come to recognize here is you have to be of service to yourself and your own community before you can be of service to others. And that's what they're learning. That's what they're learning when they have their hours-long meetings on Friday night to for the student body to wrestle with the issues that they that they raise with each other, motions for how things should be working at the college or in the in the student body, and they learn how to take roles. They learn how to respond to each other. Hopefully they're learning how to listen to each other. And those are basic skills that you need to, to be of service to others. Mm-hmm. And so I think it, if you, the bigger size, the harder that would be. Mm-hmm. Uh, so another kind of implication of size, I think L.L. Nunn's theory of change, you could say, was an elite one, right? That um, this, is a, this is an intense focus education it's fully paid for for the people who are there um you know it is it is rigorous in all kinds of different ways but the intention is that this is a group of people who will have a an outsized impact on on the world in the state of the world um is that is that you know how, how does that uh, to that that theory work out in, in practice and uh, is that how you understand it, the mission absolutely and And what counts as service, I think, is really broad. Mm -hmm. Um, And where where I see it playing out is, as in my role here, one of the things I really enjoy and have the opportunity to do is to talk to a lot of alums and to to see what alums have gone on to do, and also to hear how much they point back to Deep Springs as critical. In leading them to doing what they do, and even though they're only here for for two, usually for two years. I mean, at, at the time of LL Nunn, they they might have been here for three. And I was just rereading the Gray Book, which is a they call it the Constitution. It's a collection of letters he wrote to the mm-hmm. student body mostly. And there's even a line in there where he said he expected they would be here for three or four years. Hmm. and then go on to college. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and that didn't prove practical over, over time, and it, 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 that's one thing that changed is it became primarily a two-year program with students who can petition for a third year but doesn't happen very often. Mm-hmm. Um, but this, the, the alums will still point back to how critical those two years were in, in their lives in thinking about what service is and feeling a sense of obligation because they get a free education here. They get a full scholarship. 
and that comes with they're called, they're called none called the students the beneficial owners of of Deep Springs, but ownership comes with with responsibilities and obligations to to be to be good stewards to take care of each other to take care of the place you own and a lot of the alums expand that to the society they live in and whether it's it's something really obvious in way of service of you know directly doing something for other people or whether it's something that's less obvious like somebody who's gone into a financial business career that a lot of people might say is not a life of service, but then it's the way they do it and what they what they do with the with the influence that they have from those positions, they turn it into a form of service, yeah. and and they're aware of what the impact is. And that now I talk to many of these alums, they point back and say, "Well, it was the challenges <laughs> at Deep Springs <laughs> that made me start thinking about this and made me start realizing that I I had this obligation." Thoreau College is a leader in an emergent movement dedicated to the renewal and revitalization of higher education through the creation of new, humanly scaled institutions with holistic curricula known as micro-colleges. Thoreau College, higher education for the whole human being. I mean, L.L. Nunn himself was a businessman, um, and there's certainly yeah. been a lot of people who've, who've started and run businesses, engineers, but also members of Congress and journalists and yep. academics. And, uh, and Ella Nunn also, you know, suggested people in manual trades, you know, where also could be servants of the moral order of the yeah. universe as well. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So you and mentioned... that's why he wanted people to learn, to learn like how to shoe a horse or how to, yeah. <laughs> how to milk cows because yeah. those manual skills or build a fence, yeah. those matter as well. So that, that's another quality of microcolleges that we've identified is, is a holistic curriculum, um, including more than just the academic. Um, at Deep Springs, this is expressed in the form of the three pillars, so which includes academics, self-governance, which you've spoken out a little bit, but also labor. So maybe could you say a bit more about, about how labor works there and then how does it fit into this, this bigger mission and vision of, of the college? Labor is critical. Uh, it means that we can have the college on a working ranch and we can feed the whole community. And um, there's the students elect the labor commissioner from, from among the student body. So the student labor commissioner then determines what are the, the tasks that need to be done, what are the labor positions. They consult with the, the various staff members here, you know, what has to happen on the ranch, what happen, has to happen in the kitchen, et cetera, in the garden. And then they assign the students to a labor role. And they're expected to do this for about roughly 20 hours a week. It, it can get more if you're moving wheel lines in the fields for mm -hmm. irrigation and the wheel lines are going, not cooperating, you have to keep at it until you can get it fixed because otherwise the crops die or you flood them or something else goes wrong. And uh, what it, the role it plays is, is, one, it gets them outside their heads. Uh, the, the students are incredibly intelligent here and really take their academics seriously and they read constantly. And one of the common questions here for anybody new that shows up on campus is, Tell me about a book you're reading. <laughs> what, what's been an influential book for you? Um, and then they'll really push the person on it. If, if you know, why? What is the, what did this author say? What is the thing, what are the ideas? But be, doing the labor it pushes them outside their heads. They have to. They're still thinking. They have to problem solve. I mean, you think about moving a wheel line. These long irrigation lines across the fields, and they're they're hard to move. They have to be perfectly straight. There's all, all kinds of connections that can go wrong. And it's hard manual labor, but it also requires problem solving. It requires responsibility. If you see a, a geyser going out in the field and you're on farm team, you run to go see what what went wrong. Why is the water going in that direction where it's not supposed to be? Um, and Or if a, a connection breaks. You have to fix it. If if you're a cook, you've got to be there and figure out how to feed 40-some people. Mm -hmm. And what's the menu? Do I have enough? Do I have enough to do it? I mean, 
I remember one student who was planning a pretty elaborate meal, and I, for whatever reason, the oven was not cooking what she had in the oven fast enough, fast mm-hmm. according to her plan, and it might have been the altitude here, who knows what it was. And yet she knew that at 6 o'clock, she had to have dinner out. And so while that was cooking, she uh, she suddenly had to make a whole other meal. <laughs> and, you know, the one that she was cooking ended up getting reheated and served the next day. <laughs> and, um, but it, it means that they, you know, they it, yeah, they might be studying Aristotle, or right now they're reading the Iliad, and... They they will at lunch. They'll be talking about things coming out of the Iliad and sort of make connections to the challenges they have in labor or um, some of the social issues that might be going on on campus. And it just helps them think about what they're learning in a different way, helps them step back from it and put it into broader contexts. They often have to work as teams on their labor, there's a, there's only a handful where they're working really independently, one uh, as one person. Um, they have to coordinate. They have to learn to listen to the supervisors, to the the student leads of their team, um, and 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 then take responsibility mm-hmm. for making sure that it's done and done right, and figure out what went wrong if something happens. And I think that fits into into the larger mission in in many ways. I mean it it helps them think about what is service and all the different things it can mean. It means they have respect for people that do manual labor. Um, and they recognize that it's it's a valuable part of what makes society work. Mm-hmm. And they they respect each other. They have to work together. Although they can, they can be pretty critical of each other if they think somebody's not carrying their weight. <laughs> right. That's part of it. Yeah. When I reflect back on my experience, um, I think, you know, all the aspects of Deep Springs, but certainly the labor, you know, had the the effect of, of really encouraging the attitude of humil- humility often. Um, I mean, the, yeah. the, the students, you know, are uh, often... The, the smartest kid in the class back home, right? They are people yeah. who, who are accustomed, especially in academic realms, to, to, to you know, doing very well. Um, they're very verbal, very, um, you know, the, the, the application process involves a lot of writing, a lot of, uh, you know, a long oral interview. So people, the things that, yeah. that, that privilege, you know, words um, and, and kind of form academic skills. So um, to get to a place where, you know, you're, you're, you're confronted with, Man, with tools and with animals and with you know practical problems like that is often um, a real um, it's a change of perspective <laughs> for these young people. Yes. Um, and uh, I mean, I grew up on a dairy farm, so I had some of that before. So it was it was an interesting experience for me to to come there. Um, but similarly, you know, the, the 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 academic experience is very challenging. It can have that effect, and and the self governance, learning to 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 coordinate. Uh, to 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 communicate um, values and practical ideas and and, and that sort of thing uh, with similarly sort of verbally and mentally kind of talented people um, is is still also a humbling experience sometimes. Um, yes. And when I think about yes. you know leadership, certainly I think that we could use a bit more humility. So that's yes. uh, <laughs> <that's great. laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and it, it's amazing to watch the particularly the chairs of the different committees. So in mm-hmm. For example, the curriculum committee is run by a student, is primarily a student committee. There's six students on it current, well, th- this past year. And the academic dean, the dean here, he's more than academic dean, he's dean of everything, <laughs> is an advisor. He's not a voting member. Mm-hmm. And sometimes there'll be a faculty member, but recently there has not been a faculty member on that committee. And you think, oh, okay, they're setting the curriculum. Well, they're doing that by hiring faculty Mm -hmm. and interviewing faculty, people with PhDs, sometimes people with extensive experience at at top-notch colleges. And here you've got these 18, 19, 20-year-olds who are interviewing them and making the recommendations as to who should be hired. Mm -hmm. And thinking about, you know, one, they they have to... explain to some of these people what Deep Springs is and how it works and and because it's not necessarily the it usually doesn't work the way the that things work at the institution they're coming from. And and then they have to assess 
the the abilities of these different faculty to teach here yeah. and you know really reading their works reading their their letters and letters of recommendation and debating what do we need here what what are the fields we need what kind of coverage how do these things all fit together and it's amazing to watch them work and in in some ways it's empowering in some ways it is humbling it's not humbling the same way as when you know <laughs> the stove catches on fire in the kitchen. <laughs> the guys are in the field, but, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, but yeah. it can be humbling in other ways because they're seeing all of these incredible scholars yeah. who want to come teach here, and 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 that they're in the position of of making these key recommendations and. Uh, it's- you know, it's amazing to watch uh, with the admissions process as well. Like you're, you're putting students in the position of making consequential decisions for people's lives, right? Including their yeah. own lives, but also the students who are admitted or, or, or not admitted, as well as the, yes. the faculty. And that's you know high stakes. And I think that's um, high stakes, certainly yeah. part of the courage of the institution to to put students in that position, as well as the the manual things that they're doing. Um, yeah. So we're um, yeah. before we got um, too too late in this interview. I wanted to ask you a bit about your own um, work, um, which has involved Buddhism and Buddhism and environmentalism, and um, and also I guess something that's near and dear to Thoreau College really is the relationship between um, spirituality, religion, um, and and the environment and higher education. I wonder if you could tell a little bit about your your research, and then also how does. What role does does uh, spirituality play in in liberal arts education? Mm. Yeah, my research is is with Buddhist monks in Thailand who, based on their understanding, their interpretation of Buddhism, do social work. They my original dissertation work was with a monk who did rural development, and ran his own nonprofit non-governmental organization that worked in 30-some villages to help farmers who were were really poor. Um, And that was in the 80s. And while I was doing that research, the environmental movement was starting in Thailand. And I became fascinated by the role of, of Buddhist monks. Were they concerned about the environment? Were they getting involved? Were they just focused on on helping people achieve awakening and what their next life would be. Um, and I I discovered some monks who, and it's a minority, most of the monks are not doing this, but there's a growing number who see the connection between the condition of the environment, the condition of people, particularly farmers, who in order to have an income to have a livelihood we're needing to cut down more and more of the forest and and the and buddhist teachings about relieving suffering and these monks tend to to say that yes the the ultimate goal of buddhism is to relieve suffering i mean you say it's the ultimate goal is to get out of the cycle of rebirth achieve awakening enlightenment as Mm -hmm. it's commonly known in english and they said well you can't you can't teach somebody to meditate and work towards awakening if they're starving or worried about how they're going to feed their children. So, and you can't help them feed their children if they're destroying the environment in, in their effort to do that. And so they started to, these monks have done things like teaching sus- different forms of sustainable agriculture and, you know, just constantly looking for ways of helping rural people have enough because they teach the middle path he said you don't need that giant truck or motorcycle you just need a basic transportation how do you find the middle way where you have enough and and you're not going for so much that you're then causing others harm and it's it's just a really fascinating approach to me that that's very commonsensical but also very difficult in in a world that really pushes material mm-hmm well-being as the measure of success. And I see that this, that kind of spirituality ties into education, not necessarily any particular religious perspective. I think religious perspectives can, can often help motivate people in these directions. I mean, L.L. Nunn was very motivated by Christianity. Um, 
but spirituality in general, thinking what is the moral purpose of something? What is the what are the implications of what I'm doing for other other beings and the ethics of what I'm what I'm doing? And that that can come out of just sort of non religious perspectives, but I think spirituality is a much broader word. Mm-hmm. And having a sense of what do we learn from the natural environment? What do we learn from slowing down and taking the time to think about something that's bigger than ourselves? Mm-hmm. And spirituality helps us think in those ways. And I think that then contributes to education that matters, that's not just focused on the self. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to say when when I saw that you were you were hired as the president and read a little about your background, that intersection between you know in, 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 spirituality, Buddhism, and and environmentalism seemed it was it was a really e- interesting um, mix with Deep Springs. I mean, Deep Springs um, is in this spectacular place, right? The uh, the 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 Deep Springs Valley is uh, it's part of the Great Basin within sight of the the Eastern Sierra, um, you know, n- nearby to the oldest organisms on the Earth, the ancient bristlecone pines. Um, and uh, you know, LL Nunn um, in his writing, it, he is you know, Deep Springs is is definitely non-sectarian, um, not part of any church or any 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 religious stream, you could say. Um, and yet, LL Nunn points to what he calls a theistic purpose or the moral order of the universe. Um, and, and part of that is actually the, the, the environment, the natural context, right? He talks about the, 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 the voice of the desert, right? As one of the, one of the, the, the reasons um, that Deep Springs is there. And one of the things the students should be doing, listening to the voice of the desert. Um, yeah. I'm wondering if that's, you know, is that something that gets talked about there on campus? Is it, uh, how do, how do people at Deep Springs understand that part of the LL Nunn legacy? I think they talk the most about the voice of the desert. They they wrestle with what that means and how you listen to it. And what what is it a voice of? Is it just listening to the coyotes howl, <laughs> uh, or is it really trying to listen to something deeper and bigger than yourself? And that's what I think LL Nunn was pushing them to do. He he, he acknowledged that yeah, you're going to hear the coyotes, you're going to hear. <laughs> You're going to hear the various animals. You're going to hear the wind, but it it pushes you outside yourself. And they do talk about that. And um, and my understanding is, it, you know, in some periods of time, that's been less focused on by by the student body, and and goes in cycles. And it's certainly currently there's a lot of a lot of discussion about religion and religious ideas here and and there's a number of people who do have their own their own practices their own their own traditions that they come from um but there's also an interest in what are they and what are they for other people and how do they influence what happens on on campus and how they're learning and and learning I don't say what their education is or their their academics but their broader learning and they they certainly seem to be aware of that and and talk about it. I mean, there's there's public speaking once a week, in which you know six or seven students give seven minute speeches, and a lot of them will focus on that kind of idea hmm. from time to time. It, and varies depending on what the prompt is they've been given. But there'll be a lot of speeches about service. Mm-hmm. What is service to humanity? And there's there's speeches about religion spirituality or the what does it mean to be here and to be in the desert to be in the mountains and um i find some of those speeches to be absolutely beautiful and fascinating and provocative that they're really wrestling with some of these ideas yeah that's beautiful i mean that that certainly resonates with my experience there um and and with the impulse that we're living with here at thoreau college um that uh, you know, I guess we mentioned you know the, the characteristics of a micro college that we've identified: size, you know, a holistic curriculum, and the third really is is a connection to place, a place-based you know it is, is in a specific environment, a specific location, and that that is um, more than just the content of the curriculum. It is there is some the sense of meaning of being in a place and and being rooted in a way that uh, certainly lives at Deep Springs strongly in my experience. 
Absolutely. And and currently the students are wrestling with that in thinking about the fact that we're on land that is Paiute and Shoshone land. Mm -hmm. And they're really, they're taking that very seriously of thinking about the history of the land goes much, much farther back than the college. And you know why was the college here, and what does that mean for the people who are already here and who were here for you know, a long, long time? Um, and that sense of place, they're in, they're including that. They're including the natural environment, and they're also including that much broader human history of of relationship between people and place, people and land, and thinking about the implications of what it means to have this college on on Paiute land. And I, I've been really impressed with the way they're wrestling with that question and and really challenging themselves to think about that <clears throat> the implications of that history. Mm-hmm. And I think that's also part of part of the sense of place, right? And and the education. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Um well Sue, I really want to thank you so much for spending some time with us. Um Deep Springs is is the, our, our lodestar, our, uh, you know, our, is really important part of, of uh, what inspires us. And um, to, to have the chance to talk to you and, and hear about the life of these things right now is, is um, it's a real privilege. Thank you so much. Oh, it, my pleasure. I mean, I, one of the things that I see as a responsibility of, of Deep Springs and of myself in particular is saying how it, it is such a small school. How do we expand the impact? How do we help and support other movements like this because it needs to be wider spread. So I really appreciate what you're doing, both at Thoreau and also with the whole micro-college movement. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. Thank Have a good day. Jacob. You too. Okay. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye.